Hey, welcome back to Timeless Testimonies. We're going to get right into this testimony in Volume 5. It is a letter to the brothers and sisters who shall assemble at the Michigan camp meeting. But again, if you recall, if you didn't see the last video, I'll mention this again. There's a little asterisk by that title for this testimony. And the note says, this appeal was written for the Michigan camp meeting, but being forgotten at that time was read before the general conference, December, 1881. So Ellen White wrote this to be read at the Michigan camp meeting. Whoever was supposed to read it forgot all about it. It wasn't delivered to God's people when it was supposed to have been. And it is an indication of the sad, sad state of things at that time. So who's the testimony addressed to? Let's keep in mind, this is to the brother, uh, brethren and sisters who shall assemble at the Michigan camp meeting. So primarily, this would have been Seventh-day Adventists, although camp meetings are open to more than just Adventist uh, members. But that's who this is addressed to. And here's how she starts. I feel a deeper interest in this meeting than in any other that has been held this season. Michigan has not had the labor which she should have had. God has planted important institutions among you, and this brings upon you greater responsibilities than upon any other conference in the whole field. Great light has been given you, and few have responded to it, yet my heart goes out in tender solicitude for our beloved people in Michigan. Tender solicitude. What a beautiful phrase. I just love that. And I wanted to make sure that I expressed the fullest extent of what solicitude means. This statement is just so full of love. And I just, I, I feel and I, it resonates in my heart and in my mind the love of God being expressed to the people through Ellen White's words. Solicitude means concern, anxiety, uneasiness of mind due to fear of evil or the desire of good. It's a windy day today. I'm sure you're hearing a lot of noise outside. I live in a yurt and so everything from outside, you can hear it all. But anyway, it's uh, beautiful lighting too with the wonderful dome above me. Anyway, back to the testimony. So she says that great light has been given you a few have responded to it. So that's a rebuke, clearly. Few have responded to it. Then she says, yet my heart goes out in tender solicitude, tender care, tender concern, tender uneasiness of mind due to fear of evil or due to the desire for good for the people. So her heart goes out in tender solicitude for the beloved people in Michigan. I just can't help but be reminded of Revelation 319. Those whom God loves, he rebukes and chastens. And you know, that's just such a, an interesting thing to contemplate. The importance of receiving rebuke as it is intended. When it's given by God, the love behind the rebuke is overpowering. And the devil will be there to tempt us when we receive correction or rebuke or whatever to think that it means that we're, that, that they don't like us, you know, that the person or whoever is rebuking us doesn't like us. Um, but you know, God's rebukes are full of love. And so even in what Ella White is writing here, she's expressing that same love. She goes on, the warning that the son of man is soon to come in the clouds of heaven has become to many a familiar tale. It's just another fairy tale. It's just another story. It's familiar. They all know about it. They all know that, oh yeah, Jesus is coming back soon. But that's just it. It has no more power than a familiar story. They have left the waiting, watching position. 
the selfish, worldly spirit manifested in the life reveals the sentiment of the heart, quote, my Lord delayeth his coming, end quote. Again, remember, the reason we have these testimonies preserved is so that we can benefit from them. It's not so we can read them and say, oh, wow, look at those people. No, it's for us. Is the soon coming of Christ, just has it become a familiar tale? Is it something that we don't really expect to happen anytime soon after all? Well, if that's the case, we will make that a reality. If enough of us take that attitude and, and our actions correspond with our belief, we will delay the second coming of Christ because uh, we are told that as soon as Christ's character is perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. He will come to claim us as his own. That's in Christ's object lessons. So if, you, you know, if you're watching this video now, you can even just pause it and just think about it. Just think, has it become a familiar tale to me? Or is it a living, abiding truth? Have I left the waiting, watching position? You know, there's a beautiful song called, What Are You Doing for Jesus? It comes to my mind just now. Is the sentiment in your heart, my Lord delayeth his coming? You know, some are enveloped in so great darkness that they openly express their unbelief, notwithstanding our Savior's declaration that all such are unfaithful servants and their portion shall be with hypocrites and unbelievers. So again, remember, this was written to the brothers and sisters who shall assemble at the Michigan camp meeting. And some have enveloped in so great darkness that they openly express their unbelief. So the context she's talking about here is in the soon return of the Son of Man, of Christ. They openly express their unbelief, notwithstanding our Savior's declaration that all such are unfaithful servants and their portion shall be with hypocrites and unbelievers. So the reason I point out that, you know, who this was written to isn't so we can be focusing on them again. It's just to show that this is written to Adventists, Seventh-day Adventists. And if we are Seventh-day Adventists, then it's written to us. Okay. Our ministers are not doing their whole duty. The attention of the people should be called to the momentous event which is so near at hand. The signs of the times should be kept fresh before their minds. The prophetic visions of Daniel and John foretell a period of moral darkness and declension, but at the time of the end, the time in which we are now living, the vision was to speak and not lie. When the signs predicted begin to come to pass, the waiting, watching ones are bidden to look up and lift up their heads and rejoice because their redemption draweth nigh. When these things are dwelt upon as they should be, scoffers will be developed who walk after their own lusts, saying, quote, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. End quote. But when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Thank God all will not be rocked to sleep in the cradle of carnal security. There will be faithful ones who will discern the signs of the times. While a large number professing present truth will deny their faith by their works, there will be some who will endure unto the end. Let's think about that for a minute. Which group will we find ourselves in? 
the large number professing present truth, who end up denying our faith by our works? Or will we be part of those some who will endure until the end? The same spirit of selfishness, of conformity to the practices of the world, exists in our day as in Noah's. Many who profess to be children of God follow their worldly pursuits with an intensity that gives the lie to their profession. They will be planting and building, buying and selling, eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the last moment of their probation. This is the condition of a large number of our own people. Because iniquity abounds, the love of many waxes cold. To but few can it be said, Ye are all the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. My soul is burdened as I see the great want of spirituality among us. The fashions and customs of the world, pride, love of amusement, love of display, extravagance in dress, in houses, in lands. These are robbing the treasury of God, turning to the gratification of self, the means which should be used to send forth the light of truth to the world. Selfish purposes are made the first consideration. The work of qualifying men to labor for the salvation of souls is not considered of so great consequence as worldly enterprises. Souls are perishing for want of knowledge. Those who have had the light of present truth and yet feel no spirit of labor to warn their fellow men of the coming judgment must give an account to God for their neglect of duty. The blood of souls will be upon their garments. That is a really, really powerful paragraph and one worthy of a lot of self-examination. And I hope that you will take the time to go back and really ponder, you know, there's a lot there, phrase by phrase. How do we fare in comparison to this description? Do we love the fashions of the world? Do we have pride? Do we love amusement? Do we love display and extravagance in dress, houses, and lands? You know, what is the first order of importance in our lives or in our minds and in our hearts and in our actions? Do we value the work of qualifying men to labor for the salvation of souls? Do we feel the burden to warn whoever it may be? It doesn't have to be on such a grand scale. Everybody isn't called to do the exact same work in the exact same way. I think that's very important for people to realize that everyone has different talents and God will put a burden on you if you are willing to be called into labor in whatever capacity you have a talent for. If you pray for that calling if you haven't received one already, you will receive one and it will be in a, in a way that you can accomplish it. And as you exercise those talents that you already have, you will develop more talents. So don't be afraid of, of asking God to show you what your talents are if you don't know what they are already and to call you to whatever labor God wants you to perform. I think it's really important to be open to being shown by God what you would be good at doing rather than asking only for a certain calling. We really tend to limit God when we think we know 
the best way of going about something and then we ask oh please open the way for me to do this specific thing or that specific thing and I'm not saying that that's never appropriate I'm really not trying to to limit people at all in what they do or how they go about finding out how to do things I'm just wanting to kind of put on your radar again like hey there's better frames of mind to be in than others and if we are just teachable humble willing servants to go wherever the lamb goeth um, then God will show us exactly how to go about whatever we're able to do and so whatever it is it doesn't have to be a big large grand thing but there is something that everyone can do and some people can do big grand things so um, don't sell yourself short either whatever our talents are we will be held accountable for them and while it's exciting like I still have kind of that that uh, joy and and that um, positive thought in mind of envisioning people really um, being open to be called into service by God at the same time I don't want to diminish from the solemnity of what she says here at the end because it is a very very serious thing if we close off that avenue if we take the attitude that we're not going to be called into service then we have to give an account to God for that neglect of duty the blood of souls will be upon our garments very important things to consider the old standard bearers are fainting and falling our young men have not been educated to feel their accountability to God. Little inducement is presented for them to labor in the cause, and they enter the fields that promise the largest remuneration with the least toil and responsibility. So, the largest payment for the least amount of effort. As a people, we are not advancing in spirituality as we near the end. We are not advancing. Oof. Ellen White says many places that if we are not advancing, we are retrograding. So to say that as a people, we are not advancing in spirituality is, according to her terminology, equivalent to saying as a people, we are retrograding in spirituality. And she does say, um, I forget what year this was written, but she said that... Um, God's people were steadily retreating toward Egypt. So that is retrograding. We do not realize the magnitude and importance of the work before us. Hence, our plans are not becoming wider and more comprehensive. There is a sad lack of men and women prepared to carry forward the increasing work for this time. Women, there's a work for you too. And she knew it, clearly she was a woman, and God knows it too. God calls women to the ministry just as much as he calls men. And we all have something to offer to the work of sharing the gospel message with the world. We are not doing one-twentieth part of what God requires us to do. There has been a departure from the simplicity of the work, making it intricate, difficult to understand, and difficult to execute. The judgment and wisdom of man rather than of God has too often guided and controlled. Many feel that they have not time to watch for souls as they that must give account. And what excuse will they render for this neglect of the important work which was theirs to do? At our college, young men should be educated in as careful and thorough a manner as possible that they may be prepared to labor for God. This was the object for which the institution was brought into existence. Our brethren abroad should feel an interest not only to sustain but to guard the college, that it may not be turned away from its design and be molded after other institutions of the kind. The religious interest should be constantly guarded. Time is drawing to a close. Eternity is near. 
the great harvest is to be gathered. What are we doing to prepare for this work? So that's a question she asks. And it's not just a question for them, it's a question for us. What are we doing to prepare for this work? The leading men in our college should be men of piety and devotion. They should make the Bible the rule and guide of life, giving heed to the sure word of prophecy as to a light that shineth in a dark place. Not one of us should dare to be off guard for a moment. For in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. It is only those who continue faithful in well-doing that shall reap the reward. Much that has no part in Christ is allowed a place among us. Unconsecrated ministers, professors, and teachers assist Satan to plant his banner in our very strongholds. So what is the case? What is the reality so much further down in the years from when this was written? Those are just things to contemplate in self-examination. If you're a teacher, if you're a minister, what impact are you having in the schools or the institutions where you are employed? The design of our college has been stated again and again. Yet many are so blinded by the God of this world that its real object is not understood. God designed that young men should there be drawn to him, that they should there obtain a preparation to preach the gospel of Christ, to bring out of the exhaustless treasury of God's word things both new and old for the instruction and edification of the people. Teachers and professors should have a vivid sense of the perils of this time and the work that must be accomplished to prepare a people to stand in the day of God. Some of the teachers have been scattering from Christ instead of gathering with him. By their own example, they lead those under their charge to adopt the customs and habits of worldlings. That is so important. Are we adopting the customs and habits of worldlings? You know, that's too much to get into right now, but the testimonies for the church are full of instruction on these reforms. And, you know, just this, the Bible has so much to say about ways to keep separate from the world. Now, we are still in the world, but we don't have to be of the world. But I also want to mention that there's a difference between worldliness and secular or common. There's the common and the sacred. And while all days of the week, um, well, six days of the week are common days, and then there's one sacred day. And it's not that those common days are bad. There's nothing wrong with the other six days of the week. It's just that there is a day that was set aside as sacred. It was set aside as holy because it is a sign between us and Yahweh that we choose Yahweh as our God rather than Satan or any of the other wicked gods, any of the other fallen angels that are you know, deemed the gods of this world, right? So the Sabbath is a sign, but it doesn't mean that the other days, just because they're common, that they're evil or something. And I think that's important to keep in mind because extremes can be taken with the idea of worldliness, you know, uh, avoiding becoming like the world or whatever. And Ellen White makes a statement in regard to the dress reform where we're, we're, we don't have to purposely dress in a way that's like just for the sake of being different and to like draw attention to ourselves or to look dowdy or anything like that. Um, she even goes so far as to say that if the world should adopt uh, a custom of dress that's 
fitting for the dress reform. There's nothing wrong with dressing like the world. It's not dressing like the world as a term that is wrong. Because if the world is doing something that's right, then it's right. It stands on its own merits. It's right. It's moral. So I think that's important to keep in mind if we're reading this and we see, um, you know, we, we read this phrase, by their own example, they lead those under their charge to adopt the customs and habits of worldlings that we need to keep in mind that she's not just talking about common things like something that isn't wrong in and of itself, but it's just different from a peculiarity of Seventh-day Adventist or something. That's not the point. The point is something that is out of harmony with morality, out of harmony with principles of truth. So maybe down the road we'll talk about that more, but um, that just came to my mind now and I thought it was important to at least touch on a little bit. They link the hands of the students with fashionable, amusement-loving unbelievers and carry them an advanced step toward the world and away from Christ. And they do this in the face of warnings from heaven, not only those given to the people in general, but personal appeals to themselves. The anger of the Lord is kindled for these things. In other words, because of these things, it kindles the anger of the Lord. God will test the fidelity of his people. Many of the mistakes that are made by the professed servants of God are in consequence of their self-love, their desire for approval, their thirst for popularity. Blinded in this manner, they do not realize that they are elements of darkness rather than of light. Come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. These are the conditions upon which we may be acknowledged as the sons of God. Now she's going to give the conditions upon which we can be acknowledged as the sons and daughters of God. Separation from the world and renunciation of those things which delude and fascinate and ensnare. The Apostle Paul declares that it is impossible for the children of God to unite with worldlings. Quote, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, end quote. This does not refer to marriage alone. Any intimate relation of confidence and co-partnership with those who have no love for God or the truth is a snare. The Apostle continues, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people." End quote. In consideration of these facts, he exclaims, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate? Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. If we comply with the conditions, the Lord will fulfill to us his promises. I just love that. If we comply with the conditions, the Lord will fulfill to us his promises. That's great. I just love that. But there is a work for us to do, which we should in no wise neglect. In the strength of Jesus, we can perform it aright. In the strength of Jesus, his example, his life, he has shown us how we can overcome temptation. You know, it is written, the truth, fighting the lies with the truth. His perfect example shows us that we can overcome just like he overcame. 
we may press ever onward and upward, constantly growing in grace and in a knowledge of the truth. The children of the light and of the day are not to gather about them the shades of night and darkness which encompass the workers of iniquity. On the contrary, they are to stand faithfully at their post of duty as light bearers, gathering light from God to shed upon those in darkness. The Lord requires his people to maintain their integrity, touching not, that is, imitating not, the practices of the ungodly. Now, I love that too because she explains what the phrase, touch not the unclean thing. You know, the, the phrase touch not means imitate not. Touching not, that is imitating not, the practices of the ungodly. That just illuminates that passage so much. I just love that. Christians will be in this world and holy nation a peculiar people showing forth the praises of him who hath called them out of darkness into his marvelous light. This light is not to grow dim, but to shine brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. I love that too. The light will continue to get larger, brighter, bigger, more, greater, all of that. It's going to shine brighter and brighter unto the perfect day, unto the second coming of Christ. Christ's standard bearers are never to be off duty. They have a vigilant foe who is waiting and watching to take the fort. Some of Christ's professed watchmen have invited the enemy into their stronghold, have mingled with them, and in their efforts to please, have broken down the distinction between the children of God and the children of Satan. The Lord never designed that our college should imitate other institutions of learning. The religious element should be the controlling power. I just want to pause there for a second. That could be misinterpreted. The religious element should be the controlling power. There's a lot to be cautious about there. True religion is this, right? I believe that's from James. This is just coming to my mind now, so I hope I do it justice. To take in the fatherless, to help the widow, you know, it's about love and taking care of one another. True religion is this. Hmm. What is the church? It's The unity is not on doctrine, points of doctrine, and that sort of thing. Doctrine's important, because if it's not, if you're not believing truth, you know, you need to have right doctrine. But if one group of believers read this and they interpreted religion to be one thing, and then another group read this and interpreted religion to be their idea of what religion is, maybe their idea of religion isn't the right idea of religion. Maybe there's some oppressive elements there. Well, that shouldn't be the controlling power, right? We need to remember the principles that govern all counsel and be careful that we aren't allowing our biases to affect how we interpret what we're reading. So I'll read that again for context. The Lord never designed that our college should imitate other institutions of learning. The religious element should be the controlling power. If unbelievers choose this influence, it is well. If those who are in darkness choose to come to the light, it is as God would have it. But to relax our vigilance and let the worldly element take the lead in order to secure students is contrary to the will of God. Now, there's the context for what she means by the religious element should be the controlling power. She's just contrasting the religious with the worldly. So, I think that's really important that we're looking to the text that we're reading to inform us of the intent of the author. 
The strength of our college is in keeping the religious element in the ascendancy. When teachers or professors shall sacrifice religious principle to please a worldly, amusement-loving class, they should be considered unfaithful to their trust and should be discharged. The thrilling truth that has been sounding in our ears for many years, quote, The Lord is at hand, be ye also ready, end quote, is no less the truth today than when we first heard the message. The dearest interests of the church and people of God and the destiny of an impenitent and ungodly world for time and for eternity are here involved. We are all judgment bound. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain, brackets, unto the coming of the Lord, end bracket, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, end quote. Christ will then be revealed from heaven, quote, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel, end quote. Okay, taking vengeance upon them that know not God and that obey not the gospel. I do believe that the expression and that obey not the gospel is informing us of what is meant by them that know not God. You know, this ancient language in, used in the Bible of knowing someone and that sort of thing and you know having an intimate connection with them and it can be used for um, an intimacy that a husband and wife would have too in knowing that sort of thing but to know not God that really doesn't strike me as someone who has never heard of Yahweh well if they've never heard of Yahweh well then what guilt do they have you know, um, I believe it's Paul that wrote, um, or maybe it was Peter, but I'll find the reference and put it down below. He made a statement in regard to the Gentiles who know not the law of God, but who um, have the law written on their hearts, or they by nature do that which is written in the law. They become a law unto themselves. In other words, even if someone has lived and they never knew anything about Yahweh or they lived after Jesus and, and they never, never knew anything about Jesus or that um, Jesus came to reveal the love of the Father and to show us how we can overcome sin and all of that, if they are by nature doing that which is contained in the law anyway, the law is just a transcript of God's character. It's not just an arbitrary thing that God decided, hmm, you know what, I need a set of rules and I'm going to say this and this and this and then if people don't know what the rules are, well, you know, too bad for them. We're told that the angels in heaven didn't even know that there was a law prior to the rebellion of Satan. Like, they, they weren't doing the things that were in the law because they had been given a list of do's and don'ts. It was just living out love and unity and living according to truth, living in harmony with morality and that sort of thing. So I could imagine somebody reading this and thinking, oh, see right there, the Bible says that those who don't know God, God will take vengeance on them. But I just don't believe that that is in the character of God. And I believe that this context is indeed informing us of what it means to know not God. Those who obey not the gospel. Those who are not doing the works of love and righteousness. Those who are unloving and unkind. So we have just one more paragraph to go before uh, we'll end for this section. 
it's not the end of the letter to the camp meeting, but it is the end of a heading. So she'll be getting into something a little bit different in just a moment called responsibility of ministers. But to tie this up for now, because we have been going on for a while now, she just gets through talking about how, hey, you know, the, the same thrilling truth that's been sounding in our ears for all this time, it, it's still just as much present truth today. Christ is coming back soon. We're all going to have to face the judgment, that sort of thing. Okay, so then she says this. These momentous events are nigh at hand, yet many who profess to believe the truth are asleep. They will surely be numbered with the unfaithful servant who saith in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, if they remain in their present position of friendship with the world. It is only to those who are waiting in hope and faith that Christ will appear without sin unto salvation. Many have the theory of the truth who know not the power of godliness. If the word of God dwelt in the heart, it would control the life. Faith, purity, and conformity to the will of God would testify to its sanctifying power. I just want to look at that a little bit because what she's focusing on here is the nearness of the coming of Christ. It's nigh at hand. It's just as thrilling of a truth, you know, at when she wrote that, and I would say it is still today just as thrilling of a truth as it was when it was first um, taught or first brought up. So that's kind of what she's pointing out here. Her thrust is, hey, it's, it's near at hand. It's nigh. And that... Uh, even even though it's near at hand, there are still many who profess to believe the truth that are asleep. Then she says, They will surely be numbered with the unfaithful servant who saith in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming. And for some reason when I read that, my mind immediately went to where there are people who uh, say to Jesus, you know, Lord, Lord, did I not do all these wonderful, mighty works in your name? Like, didn't I do this and didn't I do that? And he says, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, or you lawless people, or you lawbreakers. You know, it's really noteworthy that those who cry, Lord, Lord, and are told, I never knew you, they knew who Jesus was. They called him Lord, but he said, I never knew you. And in the context, Jesus says, depart from me, you lawbreakers. Now, in the statement by Ellen White, where she's quoting, it's, it's not a statement that originated with her, but she's quoting, and she says that Christ will then be revealed from heaven, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel. That seems to fit hand in glove with that parable of those crying out, Lord, Lord, Christ says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. So to say that we know God and know Christ and we are breaking God's law, it's not enough to profess that it's true. Are we living it out? If we are not, then we are showing that our profession is a dishonest profession. So anyway, we'll end there for now. And in a future video, I will continue on with this address to the camp meeting. And again, of course, it wasn't read at the camp meeting. It was read a while later at the general conference. But anyway, many, many blessings to you. And... Thank you for investigating the testimonies for the church because Christ is waiting with longing desire for his character to be reproduced in his people so that he can come to claim us as his own. And we, every Christian, has the privilege of hastening the return of Christ.